rising our achievement, if it's the, the unity that we're seeing um, among our entire communities, or the partnerships that we're just pouring into us to make a uh, really special career here in for our students. We're, we're just surrounded by positivity and support. Um, and, and so the reason that we're here today is to talk about uh, our levy of learning. The board has passed a resolution to move forward with putting a levy on the ballot in March 2020. And so we want to make sure that everybody understands um, all, all of the details that they need to know about our financial uh, situation and be able to communicate that with other co workers or families or community members. How many of you here live also and work in this environment? Okay, several of you. How many of you have been in our since 2004? Just, just a few of you. Well, part of our message today is really to take us through the history of the financial story right here in Los Angeles and the ups and downs and how we see things moving forward. forward. So uh, we appreciate your time and joining us today. So as you know, Paul and I have been together in the district. We joined last year, and uh, November actually marks our first year of anniversary being together, uh, learning about the finances of the district. Because it's, when we were hired, it was made very clear it's a top priority of our Board of Education and our community to get our finances in good order and to make sure we are moving forward in the district. And so what I want to highlight is our Board of Education. You may or may not know them. We have in the picture of a big staff as a board member. Ginger Reed was the vice president. Tammy Brinkman, board member. Tina Sam, board president. And Michelle Delaney, she's our newest member of the Board of Education. We're just grateful to have their leadership in our community. Um, they're all very passionate about the students in West Santa Ana and want to see really good things happen there. And so uh, we enjoy working together. Um, this is Senator and I, and we love this district. I want to see some really great things happen. And, and so, so part of our mission here, and really since the school started, has been to get as many audiences as possible uh, to share our financial uh, journey so that we can understand the ups and downs that have happened here over the last 15 years. Because the truth is, the district has had to make a lot of tough decisions. There's been failed ladies. And that the, the finance has been a true struggle. And then what we want to make sure that everyone understands that struggle, understands why we are where we are, and that we have a, a hope for the future of moving forward. So this is graphic that really represents the work that Kelly and I have been doing since the spring of last year. It steps you through the key questions we're asking what kind of school district would we want to have? Who would we want to be? So we've led the district through a strategic planning process that really asks that question so we can focus on what's our vision for teaching and learning. Knowing that the job market is changing, technology is advancing all around us, we know that the school experience is going to continue to evolve. So what should that look like? And at that same time, we've been working with all of our community members, and families, and business leaders to also look at our finances, to make sure that the plans that we're making will be in alignment with our budget, and then we'll be able to, uh, to take care of those details. And during this process, asking the question what kind of school district we want to be and looking at our financial reality, we've also surveyed the district community um, in several different ways. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those results as we've been getting. And then this graphic kind of takes us from here from about November on to the March to the March 2020. And that just really details us through the steps that we can take as leaders in this district to continue to educate our community on our financial situation and to make sure that people are understanding the, the vision that we have with the future generations in our so that we have people engaged and excited about all that is possible here. We truly believe that we have amazing potential to us around. And this is really the place to be. And what we know, and why we chose the words together as one community to be as a part as the first part of our vision, is that we know that we will be immeasurably better when we're working together. And I don't say that just to throw a play on the words, but because we mean it. We know that we could not be successful in uh, meeting our vision in the school district to, to reach kids, to, to, to pour into them, without all the community, all the staff, all the students, all the parents coming together with the teacher. And so as a community, what we want to do is make sure that we are investing in our students so that they can learn the skills, the skills and the knowledge that they need that we can uh, tap into their passions and their interests, and so that when they walk across that stage at CentOS on their graduation year, that they truly have a plan for their future. 
And it can bless their mind, but work really hard to say that some kids are going to enroll, some kids are going to list, and some kids are going to be employed. We want to make sure that we, we know that there's multiple paths for students, and that we want to do everything that we can to prepare them for those paths. Um, because every student is unique, and they have special needs that uh, we need to address. And as we work through learning, that's really taking care of the academic intelligence that we want to foster and we want to grow. We also, when we use the word lead, we want to focus on the social emotional development of students. We want to make sure that students are emotionally intelligent, the ability to work with others and to lead others as they uh, pursue their interests beyond uh, post graduation. And because uh, it's so important to us that we work together as a team to achieve that success. And so a big part of our vision as we work to uh, commit to excellence every learner, every day, every way, is uh, in our strategic plan is to ensure that our entire community is very well equipped with understanding our financial reality. That is really job number one for us in our strategic plan, is making sure that those details are known so that people can make uh, all of the decisions for their students and for our community. So we've been taking a considerable time working around the district to make sure that our financial reality is understood by all. So on this slide, you can see just some details that uh, cover that, uh, the reality that we've been sharing with others. So this is here it is. We've addressed many of our facility needs. It's not all of them in our school district, but many of them have been taken care of, and we are very, very grateful for that. But the fact remains that we have needs for our day-to-day -day operations for paying for our staff, for our busing, for our utilities. And uh, we've got to turn our attention into funding the teaching and learning in a significant way in our school district. We already are low spending school district because we have stretched our dollars, we have reduced, we have made cuts, we've done everything we can to live within our needs. And what this has resulted in, what this ultimately means, is that our students and our staff are often going without things that, that are standard in most districts. And so we do our very best to, to, to make it work, to make things happen for our kids. But because of our low spending, being in the bottom 5% in the state of Ohio, um, we're, just, we're not able to provide everything that happens in other school districts. And because our revenues are not keeping pace with our expenditures, um, we are, we are uh, continuing to, to take a look at our finances and look for additional uh, ways to, to up up that revenue. We are 24% um, below the state average when it comes to spending in our school system. And what this ends up equating to, if you uh, look at it over a course of a year, is that we spend about $23 million less than what most schools that are like us in size and economic and economics uh, can do. And so that, that certainly um, plays a, a big part in, in what we're able to offer our students. And since we are such a low spending district, any kind of cuts that we would have to do, any kind of reductions or changes we would have to make to get educational programming, would certainly have an impact on our students. Um, everyone would feel this. This wouldn't be about just turning the fact, it really is a fact trend. That has already happened. And so um, the kinds of cuts that we would have to make would, would have an impact on our student experience and would be felt by everyone. And so we believe very strongly that a ballot issue is needed here in March 2020 so that we can stabilize what we're going to offer for our students, that we're able to give a stronger foundation from which we can continue to work. So we are on the rise here as a parent. We are in a place where there's a lot of positive momentum and good things are happening here, and we want to do everything we can to protect that. So we are, um, as I mentioned before, we're taking the first steps, our board taking the first steps to put a 7.99 mill levy on the March 2020 ballot. And you can see on this slide how it will affect each person, each homeowner. So it starts with the top of the chart. If you're at home, it's at $100,000. This would be a $23.30 add um, to, to the monthly um, tax bills. And again, as the levy, we would focus on sustaining and protecting our current level of services and programs that we have. It's important that we are able to provide a predictable budget and that we are get our finances to a stable place so that we can keep our focus on academic achievement that we can make sure that we are developing the social emotional side of kids and that we are preparing them for the future when we walk across that stage. And so this levy would allow us to stabilize in such a way that we can continue to do that, that work. 
Uh, no, this does not restore, restore all the things from the past that we know are missing here in our school district, but it does do some things for us. It allows us to keep the class sizes that we have that were crowded, especially in the elementary schools. It allows us to keep a staff who worked hard to recruit talented staff and uh, develop them. And we, wanna, we don't want to be the best farm team in all the other school districts out there. We want to be able to keep those teachers here, keep them um, developed in our system. We would, we would um, with this levy, we would be able to teach all of our extracurriculars as a place. We'd be able to keep the great work that we're doing in literacy that we got with the $100 million grant. We'd be able to continue to bring books to our libraries. We'll be able to really reap the benefits and be able to maximize the use of our facilities, the flexible furniture, and all the great things that are happening there. We'll be able to uh, provide the social emotional supports that students need in this day and age to be able to thrive in their school environment. And we'll be able to keep all the leadership programs. And we'll be able to keep up a great level of customer service. So even though it's a, a 7.99 year levy that works on stabilization, there's so many great things that are happening. And we just want to protect us and make sure that we don't take one step backwards in our district. And even though we all want more for our students, and we know we need more for our staff, we are grateful that how do we do that? And we want to make sure that we're protecting it with everything we can. Because we are still working with money that we received from the 2004 operating levy. So a lot of great things have happened from 2004 to now. And we don't want to slide that backwards. We don't want to go back to first students. Now, our staff does an amazing job with the resources that they do have. And so I just want to celebrate some of that. I share some of the facts about the district that you may or may not know. First of all, last year we had 588 graduates walk across that stage and send talks. It was just an amazing event and something that they were really proud of. And the students in that graduating class earned $10 million of scholarship for money. So kids are being successful here and they are moving on and doing great, great things all of the beyond. We were able to have 56% of our students attending college, 40% in the workforce, and 4% in the military. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we're working hard to make sure that people know that just because you don't go to college, that that's a dead end, that there are lots of opportunities in the workforce, in the military, where you want people to broaden their perspectives and really be trained well to take advantage of the skills they build at school to, uh, to be a contributor to society and they graduate from across the planet. Our overall rating from the state of Ohio is a C. And that's something, although we're proud of, we know we can do better, we want to do better, we believe investing in our school system will allow us to continue to inch by inch to increase those outcomes for our students. Um, we feed, uh, well, we, we, we make 684,000 meals um, served here every, uh, every school year from breakfast that we provide to lunch. And it's such an important thing, especially with the making of our community, with 33.7% of our students being economically disadvantaged. This is the fuel for them to be nourished and to be taken care of. And we take a lot of pride in that. Our special education population is 14%. And we speak 24 different languages here in Los And I don't know if you're aware of that, but the, the, the talent that the teachers and all the staff have to have to be able to attend a very diverse population like that is, is really quite incredible. And it's something that our teachers and our staff take very seriously and they're proud of. And uh, if you do this, we're about there are 6,000 miles um, per day that are driven by our bus drivers. So we spend a lot of territory here in Los Angeles and uh, do a great job getting these kids to and from school um, to the best of our abilities. And so we are proud of what we do. And what I want to share with you is just a little more detail about what our community thinks about our success. So we completed a survey here community-wide, and 70% of the people who participated were members of the community who don't have children in school, and 30% of the people were, were participants who do have children in school. So it really is a good cross-section of our community. And what we learned through the survey is that when um, the participants who are voters thought of us as a parent, would they say that we were generally going in the right direction or on the wrong track? And so you can see we can see the 64.2 percentage rate positive that we're going in the right direction. And so anything, anytime you do a survey like this, a number over 60 is, is uh, a great number. It's a strong uh, uh, kind of a testament to um, what people feel. And, and there's a lot of positive feelings about our interest right now. In the question, how would you rate the quality of education provided by those parents' schools, we dipped down a bit, but it's 
still has a rating of 59%. And what I do believe uh, that that number is there, not because of the quality of educators that we have here and what we're trying to do, it's just the lack of programming that we're able to offer because of the failure that is the past. And so 66% of the positive rate rates were given to uh, this question. How would you rate the work being done by the classroom teachers? Time and time again, the community rate rates our teachers really high, and they value what happens in the classroom. So we commit to continuing to support our teachers and uh, to invest in them so that we can have great outcomes for our kids. So this is overall gives us a really good sense that our community is behind us, and they want to see good things happen for us. As the Board of Education, as the staff, and as the administrators here, we are completely committed to continuous improvement. And we want to see these numbers only go up from here. And so in order to reach our vision so that all students can learn, lead, and succeed, and be successful in their life post-graduation, um, our first step for that is really stabilizing our finances. And um, we, we want to commit to that and make sure that we have a strong foundation that we stand on. And so what I want to have now is uh, Mrs. Senator come up to talk to you a little bit more depth about the details of our finances so you can have a good understanding and be able to share these with, um, with other community members, your neighbors, or families, so that they can understand uh, our finances and really realize why our first, most important step is uh, providing a stable uh, financing system for our district. So, okay. So what have you lived in our school district for many, many years, for many, many, many years in the community? You may not realize that we are the 24th largest school district in the state of Ohio in terms of public school districts. The Ohio Department of Education every year provides financial data as well as statistical data on 607 of those public school districts in the state of Ohio. We rank 24th largest in terms of our average daily membership out of those 607 schools. We operate in nine school buildings and have an average grade level size of 650 students. We are the seventh largest employer in Claremont County with about 850 employees. That's a combination of full-time and part-time employees. And we have a per pupil spending that is in the 5% lowest in the state of Ohio in terms of public schools. And that per pupil spending, the amount we spend per student is 24% less than the statewide average. And we operate on an $80 million operating budget. And I stress operating because unless you dabble in school finance very much um, or you, you look at financial statements of school districts very much, it can be really confusing about what is she talking about, operating versus non-operating versus construction. So we put together this slide to hopefully try to clarify that. When we're talking about operating funds, we're talking about what it takes to run the district on a day-to-day -day basis. The majority of our staffing costs, it's our supplies, it's our materials, and it's our K-8 busing. That's what operating is. What operating is not is everything that you see below the line. So for West Claremont, our food services run about $2.6 million a year. So all of the staffing that it takes to prepare your food and serve the food, as well as all of the food commodities, as well as the equipment that it takes to prepare that food, as well as all of the funds that parents are paying every day for their kids to eat breakfast and, and lunch. All of that is segregated into a food service account, and that is not considered day-to-day -day operating. We talk about the grants. We receive $5.5 million in grants here at West Claremont. Those by law have to be segregated, and they're used for the specific purpose in the grant agreement. Um, those are not operating. We have a bond retirement fund. Here in West Claremont, the community uh, approved a bond issue back in 2007 for Amelia and WTL in the tree construction. So when you pay the property tax bill twice a year, part of that includes that bond issue in it. By law, we have to set that money aside and pay our annual bond payment on that. So that is not considered operating. We have permanent improvement funds for all of our construction that goes on here at West Claremont. So the $45 million that we recently received from the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission that has to be kept separate can only be used for construction. All of the funding uh, that we received in the here at West Claremont in what's called Inside Millage that we received from the county auditor, it's about $60 million a year. 
We have to dedicate that for permanent improvement, and that's required by law and by resolution that was passed by the board many years ago. And we use that to pay for the majority of the goods we pay for our annual payment on this high school. In addition to that, because we're involved in OFCC construction projects, we have to set aside about $628,000 a year for maintenance on all of these OFCC projects. So that is what is accounted for in the permanent improvement funds, not day-to-day -day operating. And finally, all of our student activities. So if you pay them your student for payday lead, or maybe they're in a science class and you have a science lab fee, all of those fees have to be segregated and are, and are accounted for in our student activities. They're not considered to be the day-to-day -day operating. So when I refer to operating, to give perspective on where that money comes from and how it's spent, 42% of our operating revenue comes from the Ohio Department of Education in the state of Ohio. We get about $500,000 a year for casino funding, and the rest of it comes from the Ohio Department of Education. Uh, many years ago, the state developed what was called a school funding formula, which was later determined to be unconstitutional, but is yet to be fixed. Uh, in 2019, that funding formula started with a base that said every student is worth $6,020 in terms of the funding that the state allocates in that formula. What the state then does, does is look at your property values in your school district as well as your wealth and determines of that $6,020 how much the state can give to West Claremont. We receive 45% of that $6,020 and that comes to us and makes up that 42% of the pot. Local property taxes are 48% of our total operating revenues. So this pie chart reminds us every single day that we're not just educating these kids, but this community is so incredibly important to us because 48% of our operating revenues come to us from local property taxpayers. 6% comes to us from the state in the terms of homestead exemptions. So if you own property here in uh, West Claremont and you meet certain criteria, the state will pay part of your property tax bill and remit that to West Claremont, and that makes up that 6%. And finally, we have all other revenue. We receive some tip taxes from the financing revenues for Pierce and Union Township, and we also have some interest income in here, making up that 4%. In terms of where we spend our money, 69% is spent on personnel. Salary and benefits makes up the majority of our operating budget. Purchase services make up 28%. That's $7 million for K-8 busing. That's also $7 million that goes out of the door to other school districts because the child in West Claremont is educated somewhere outside of our, our doors. Maybe they get out to New Virginia, or they get to Tate, or they choose to go to a community school or possibly they have very intense needs and so they need to be um, in, a, in a different educational setting. So that's about $7 million a year. In addition to that, um, our utilities are in there as well, and that makes up our 28, majority of that 28% piece of the pie. Our custodial and labor supplies make up 1%. Our capital outlay makes us 1%. That's uh, things like our one the book program, where our students in 6th through 6th and 10th grade are able to take a promo uh, home with them every night in order to do their homework um, and to stay in touch with their school. Um, that makes us a, a large percentage of that capital outlay. In addition to that, we have a little piece of the pie that's 1% other. That consists primarily of county auditor and treasurer fees. So when the county auditor pays us our property taxes twice a year, she by law is permitted, and there's a formula in the, in the revised code that says that she's able to retain a portion of that, um, and that is what's called county auditor treasurer fees. And for us here at West Claremont, that's about $500,000. So that's how we spend our operating money. If we were to look at our per pupil spending and see where we compare, uh, I pulled 15 of the surrounding school districts, as well as the statewide average, and what the state considers to be similar district average. And you can see that Sycamore ranks up there at the top at 14,129 that they spend in per student. The statewide average, three from the top there, is $11,953. The most similar school districts like us in the state of Ohio. Their average is $11,194, and 
And then you can see that Western Mount spent $9,076 per student for that over the pay um, ranking people the list. So if we were to analyze our rating, our spending per student, compared to the statewide average, just to see what that difference looks like. We spend $9,076 a year per student, compared to the statewide average of $1,953, for a difference of $2,877 less per student that we spend in the statewide average. If we multiply that by our end of the year enrollment, which was $7,966, you can see that on an annual basis, we spend about $22.9 million less than the statewide average um, on all of our students. So when the doctor and I first started uh, here a couple of months, we were together, we were meeting with some business leaders here in the community, and we were talking about our spending, and we were talking about the last time we had a levy. And one of the questions to us was, well, how did you get to be one of the lowest spending districts in the state? So in addition to, to operating a pretty lean operating budget, there were four significant events that have happened financially that have contributed to us being one of the lowest spending districts in the state. We've had no new operating, uh, operating issues here on our ballot since 2004 in terms of new money. In 2004, this community supported a 7.9 million levy that was to generate $9,750,000. And because, and that money still generates that today. It was a five-year levy, and we went back to voters and asked for it to be renewed in 2009, and it was supported again. But because of the stipulation that's in the law that's known as House Bill 920, the levy today still generates $9,750,000. So 15 years later, even though we've had all of this construction, there are a lot of new residential properties that have gone up, the levy still generates $9,750,000. So when your local revenue is staying pretty static and your bus contract goes up 2% and your supplies go up 2% because of inflationary increases, your gasoline goes up, it's very, very difficult for your revenues to stay in line with your expenditures because your expenditures have inflationary growth built into it, but your revenues do not. And it's because of House Bill 920 that school districts often are going back to their community um, in three years, four years, five years, on a routine basis, asking for additional operating uh, revenues. We've had multiple failed operating levels here in the district in school years 2011, 12, 13, and 14. And during those years, there were significant cuts to programs and services. And also during those years, we saw a decline in our enrollment and we saw a decline in our academic performance. And then finally, during this time period, in 2013, because of the failed levies and because of our global revenue staying the same and we weren't getting additional, significant additional revenue from the state, the state replaced the district with what's called fiscal caution. And when you're placed in that status, the district is just required to develop a remediation plan to just step out and explain exactly how you're going to get out of this financial crisis that you're in. And in the case of West Central, that happened by making deep significant cuts, which is the result of things like not having high school buses today or not having pool specials. So the things that were taken away during those years um, were how the district got out of the fiscal cautious status. Also, during those years, many of you, for those of you that were here, you remember there was a three-year salary freeze that happened. No increases across the district for three years. The operating five-year forecast is required to be filed with the state twice a year, and this is a summary of what our forecast looks like. This is just our operating funds. And that summary shows that our, our average growth of revenue over this five-year period is expected to be 1.83%, while our expenditures are expected to grow at 3.71%. So when you've got revenues that aren't keeping pace with those expenditures, which include things like inflationary growth um, and our union negotiated agreements that have been contracted through 2020, um, and then we have 2.5% increases in there for 2021, 22, 23, 24. We haven't brought any new programs back. There's no high school busing to add back here. So just inflationary increases plus those personnel expenses 
and things like healthcare um, are in there that are growing at uh, what are considered to be industry standards right now, or industry averages. You can see that what that does to this cash balance is it drives down to the red, or in this case, yellow, of 28.1 million, which obviously isn't sustainable. So this is the reason why we're asking for a ballot issue in March of 2020. This isn't something that just happened overnight. This has been in discussion for a very long time. As Ms. Tasha mentioned, when she and I were both hired, you know, this was one of the main things that they talked about to both of us was we know that we're going to need a ballot issue. Um, and so this isn't something that just happened overnight or it didn't just happen because of the new forecast. This has been something that has been coming for a while. Ever since the board uh, made the first step to a ballot issue on the, uh, on the March 2020 election, uh, we've been asked the question, why are you asking for more? You've made the case that our school system is going without things, so that our standard of English is trying to ask for more. And so our answer to that, though, is that we've been listening a lot to what we've been hearing in the community. And uh, we, know the, we know the history of the ballot issues here in our school system. And uh, we believe the most important thing that we can do so that we don't take one step back is to stabilize the finances in this district so that we can keep our eye on the main thing, which is teaching and learning, and not worrying about a budget that is um, not secure. And so the things that, that kind of contribute to our uh, listening and how what we've learned about where, where the community stands on supporting our schools and investing in them is that we've learned that we need to improve our communication. On the survey that we sent out community-wide, it was 45.6% uh, positive in, in rating of how well we're communicating. So that's a good indicator for us to tell us that we've got some work to do, not only inside of our system, but outside of our system, to make sure that we're not the best kept secret in town, that people know all the great things that are happening in our school system, and that the investments that they make in us are certainly uh, paying off in the outcomes for our students. We need to continue to build trust through communication, and we need to avoid uh, misconceptions, as people are often confused. You drive by West Carolina High School, where we're sitting today, and you see this beautiful building, and people think, when they look at you know, the structure itself, this school system wants for nothing, but they have plenty of money to do the things that they want to do. But as Kelly has pointed out, that's about our, uh, it's about a different funding of money. It's not about our operating. And so our ability to operate is a certain what's in crisis at this point. And so as we continue to listen to community feedback, whether it's been face to face with these surveys, we've learned that people are supportive of us. They want to see um, cuts, or they don't want to see cuts or programs to be compromised in any way. They don't want to see the teachers being reduced. But the willingness to pay and the ability to pay is what's in the question. So I want to show you this uh, data here. 66.7% of the people surveyed uh, said a positive rating. Do you support or impose additional local tax funding in the school district in order to maintain the current amount of teachers and avoid putting in programs and services? So as I said earlier, getting a 60% in a survey like this is very positive. So we believe that as a strong response. When it's followed up with the next question, though, is where we start to, uh, to really uh, take a moment and, and pause and think we've really got to be cautious about what we do do. The plan to maintain the current amount of teachers and avoid getting programs and services may be funded by a new property tax levy of 7.99 mills, which would be collected for 10 years to support or oppose this plan. So you can see that a positive rating of 66.7% dropped to 42.1% given the specifics, given the numbers, with another 16.4% really unsure. And to take it a little bit further, when you just pull out the parent responses and you just look at their data from the survey, you see that 56.0% uh, of the parents put a positive rating toward uh, the answer to this question. And for us, that's really our parents underperforming. And we, we would love to see a number that's at 62%. That would give us more confidence that our parents are totally behind us. So this story here tells us through this data that we've got a lot of work to do internally with our staff internally with our parents and with our community at large and helping everyone to understand the financial health of, of our school system. And so we are committed to doing that and, and we want to make sure that we're investing in our students so that we don't take any further steps backwards. 
On this slide, you have what a 7.99 levy would um, do and how it would impact our forecast over time. So we're going to Senator uh, give those details uh, to us. So this is a snippet uh, from the five year forecast that shows what are we getting cash balances at the beginning of this year um, that started June 1st, July 1st, 2019, and then is June 30th, 2020. We started with the beginning cash balance of $14.4 million. Our brought in the revenues from that forecast, which I mentioned earlier, are growing at about 1.87%, uh, and then brought in the expenditures right off of that forecast, which was growing at about 3.71% on average over the life of that forecast. The yellow one then shows you um, what a 7.99 million would do for what's <laughs> coming. So a 7.99 million generate $11.5 million a year. But because of the way property taxes are assessed one year and collected another year on a calendar year basis, and the fact that the school district runs on a fiscal year of July 1st to June 30th, you can see that we would receive that first full year of collections, that first full year of $11.5 million until the school uh, until the school year 2022 that is the year in June 30th 2022 and that first year we would be receiving half of it and that would be the year that it is June 30th 2021. The green row then shows you what it does to our ending cash balance and we would end the project with the projected cash balance at June 30th 2024 of 12.1 million and to give perspective on what 12.1 million is for us here at West Claremont, that's less than two months worth of operating cash. So what happens if we don't take a ballot issue? If we want to take a ballot issue in March, or if we take a ballot issue in March and that we're not to be and that we're not successful, um, we know that we would have to make cuts that following July. So we go to the ballot in March, if it's not successful, um, we would need to cut $3.5 million in that following July. Um, and what that would do to our cash balance at the end of the June 30th, 2021, you can see that it leaves us with a positive cash balance of about $4.1 million, and that's about two, two and a half weeks worth of cash. And that would be running it really tight because we know that we pay it, you know, payroll every couple of weeks. Um, what Natasha and I have, we work on this a lot um, and, in, and in great detail, and we don't want this to be threatened to anyone. This is just our physical reality. Um, we know that that's what has to happen if we were, if we were to, to be able to keep the positive cash balance and then go back on the ballot um, very quickly after that. Because if you notice, this is right back in the negative cash situation. And that's cutting that $3.5 million and assuming that $3.5 million then stays out for the life of the forecast. So we know that we would have to go right back on the ballot again um, and to get perspective of what $3.5 million is for us here at West Claremont, that's about the equivalent of 60 staff positions. So over the next month, we're going to be um, working very hard at determining what that 3.5 million is specifically, and by January we'll have um, have publicized what exactly that 3.5 million um, consists of. So with the passage of the levy in March 2020, we know that our work was not finished. We know that this is really just the first step first effort in our um, quest to, to realize our vision, and that is to stabilize. We want to make sure that we're not taking uh, backward steps with our students and with our staff, and that we are able to uh, keep our foundation strong so that we're able to keep our eye on teaching and learning. We're able to continue to invest in the social and emotional development of the whole child, as well as do everything we can to prepare them for the, the future skills that they're going to need um, post-graduation. And so we say that today is stabilized, and that's number one priority, job number one that we have to do, so that we can protect our current level of programs and services and we don't go backwards. But tomorrow, we must come together as a community and continue to work on ways that we can obtain the vital resources that we need so we can gain some ground, so we can be able to bring some resources back to the school district, so we can continue to advance educational outcomes for our students. 
And so we see this as um, very, very important because as a business has intervention, if we aren't successful in July, we will have to make immediate changes to our programming. And we just we don't want to see that happen for our students. Um, and so what, what we ask for you to do is to really come with us on a collective commitment to stay informed, to get invested in what's happening here in West Virginia. And so our website is www.westclary.org. And on it, we have a new section called Levy Info. So you'll be able to click on there and see our frequently asked questions or FAQs, as well as any other materials that we develop over the course of the next several months to help communicate our message and to make sure that everyone is informed. We want to make sure that we're not only doing face-to-face -face meetings, but we're using social media, so please follow us on social media. And you can see here our district communications link has uh, several drop-downs that if you're not following us or if you're not signed up for a newsletter, you could, you could sign up and join our list and so that you can monthly get information from us. Because again, we don't want to be the best kept secret. We want to make sure that everyone knows all the great things that are happening. We want to make sure that you're asking us questions. On this website, is a way we can just mail in questions that you have, or you can request us to have us called, or whatever. We want to make sure that you have the facts that you're equipped with all the information that you need. And as a final note here, if there is hope in the future, there is power in the present. So we fully believe we have strong hope in the future for all of us coming together to make sure that we are stabilized here in our school system, and that we are continuing to do great things for kids. So we just want to thank you for your time today, for your interest, and in learning more about our financial health, and your, your willingness to, to share that with others. Uh, at this point, I would just like to open it up. Are there any questions that you guys might have, or concerns, anything that we can share with a good group? What we have to stick around, I know it can be uh, entertaining in a big space like this uh, to, to ask these questions, but we'll be available and we will continue to be available to make sure that you have the information that you need. And again, thank you so much for your time today and your, uh, and your, your support with us and just being here and, and being a great, uh, great audience for us. Thank you.